And yeah, here we are, a finished pair of stays. Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. This week we are celebrating finishing things because this is a big week for me. This week my math dissertation is due and with that I finish the course. The deadline has not passed as I am filming this but it will have when this is live so <laughs> check my Instagram to see if I made it. <laughs> the other thing that we are celebrating is the finishing of my 18th century stays. That might not seem like much to celebrate, but I have been working on these in the background since January. January! And now they are complete. So this is a slightly different format, but I thought I'd show you the finished product first and then talk you through how I made them. You know, with the usual aesthetic shots of imperfect sewing. In case you missed the previous video and want to know more about this project, I'll link the video about mock-ups and the fitting of the stays above and below. But long story short, I wanted a pair of well-fitting 18th century stays. Focus on the well-fitting. I started off with the Scroop Patterns Augusta pattern and ended up in page 105 of Patterns of Fashion 5. These stays are dated circa 1770 to 1780 and this is not going to be a historical reproduction. I did want to hand sew them because I'm me and I enjoy hand sewing, but otherwise I'm not striving for the historical minutiae. I want a pair of well-fitting, pretty stays. They'll be made of two main fabrics, heavy linen and linen buckram. The linen buckram was purchased from eBay. I considered making my own for a hot second before it became clear that it was much cheaper to buy one meter of linen buckram than all the materials to make it. Compromises were made. My first step was to dye the heavy linen. I only dyed enough to use it as the outside fabric. At this point in time I was kind of low-key obsessed with lilac so I decided to go with lilac which is I don't think the most historical fabric color. Hello guys! Apologies for the condition of my kitchen. This is not my main so, um, filming space. Anyway, we are now drying some fabric, as I'm sure um, introduction and Kat has said. Just a quick uh, like dye journey, I guess. I wanted to dye this a sort of pale lavender lilac kind of color because I've been really digging that. Um, and this is caramel sauce I just made. This is purple with a tiny little bit of yellow. I don't know why I wanted to do it, but I did, and it's brown, so that's not useful. For whatever reason, I thought this linen would be really, really hard to dry, to dye, but um, when I made the new bath with just purple, this was less than a teaspoon of purple. Look how bright it is, amazing, I love linen. That's the same, <laughs> after being a little bit diluted. And those were in for like five minutes tops. Really amazed, this is amazing. Anyway, after that I had to really dilute down the purple and I managed to get this, which is a little bit warmer toned. And then I balanced it out with a little bit of blue to be a little bit more cooler toned. And this is pretty much what we're going for today. So the bath is ready. You can just kind of see the hues there. And this is the final recipe. So literally a tiny, 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 tiniest little bit of purple and then even smaller smaller imagine smaller than a crumb of like feta cheese smaller smaller of blue <laughs> tiny little quantities very short time so this was in there for seven minutes and this is what we're going to add it now i'm going to wet it first of course Once that was done, my three fabrics included an undyed layer of heavy linen for the lining or interlining, a layer of linen buckram, definitely for interlining, and a layer of dyed lavender heavy linen. I proceeded to cut all of the layers, including 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance on the side seams and about 3 eighths at the top and bottom. With all these layers, it meant each pattern piece needed to have a total of 6 pieces cut out.
I then proceeded to assemble my linen sandwich and basted all the pieces together. These days will be entirely hand sewn. So here are my tools. I used linen thread size th uh, 35 2, which was sold as for lace making, but worked fine for this. I waxed my thread with beeswax twice or thrice. I used a sturdy needle, I ended up going through a lot of these. The boning channels are the first step. I marked these out according to the pattern and then sew them all with a back stitch. I made sure to turn under the back section reinforcement on the centre back before sewing the channels there. This section was particularly thick, so my stitches were a little bigger. There was a lot of stitching. By the time I was done with a piece, it had taken some shape from being mangled by my hands. This pattern features a little gorge section at the side back panels. I think this is to give the back extra lift as stays were often worn over the petticoats and the back pads or rumps. For this, I cut the marked slit into the pattern piece, turned under the small seam allowance of the gore and pinned them into place. This was very fiddly and thick and I hated it. I used a whip stitch to secure it along the edges, but I wasn't happy with that sturdiness, so I also backstitched along the edge. Once all the channels and gores were sewn, I turned under the seam allowance and pressed it into place. 
I then whip stitched all of these down and it was so much quicker than back stitching. I decided to do all the eyelets as the pattern pieces were still unattached, as this would be much easier to maneuver. I marked them according to the pattern, but remember that if you're going for a spiral lacing, one side needs to be offset, and they need extra eyelets at the beginning and end. I forgot about this, so but I fixed it in time. <laughs> I also sewed about 40 smaller eyelets on the front panels. I made a perforation with an awl and then used my linen thread and a whip stitch to make neat, perhaps too small, eyelets. It was time to bun the pieces. I cut all of my synthetic whalebone to size, making sure they were shorter at the top and bottom by about half an inch. This will keep them from digging into the binding and make them more comfortable to wear. I filed the edges down and then inserted them into the channels. I already knew that my stitching hadn't been the most accurate, but this was so hard on my hands, as some of the channels turned out a little smaller than they should be. A pair of pliers helped, but I gained even more respect for the stay makers of old. I then buttered the finished edges of the pieces and whip-stitched them, whip them together with my waxed linen thread and small stitches. This was such a pleasing thing to do and definitely my favourite step, but the seam does look a little weird. The stitches look uneven and messy, but it works.
I then had two separate halves of the stays. They were sewn together at the front, but only up to the, where the eyelet started. For the binding, I decided to use kid leather. This is a sturdy and period correct material to use, but quite hard to find and expensive nowadays. I remember seeing years ago on a blog post I could not find now that someone used vintage gloves to do the binding. I decided to give them a go. They were purchased cheaply on eBay and they were very small, worn and dirty. So I didn't feel bad about cutting them up into one inch wide strips and a quarter inch wide strips. Well, I still felt a little bad. I wanted to try sewing like the stay makers of old on a table. I was skeptical at first, but it's actually quite comfortable. I sewed down the quarter inch strips to cover the seams with a small whip stitch on either side. I also did the top and bottom binding, sewing it on right sides together with a back stitch first, then flipping it over to the wrong side, hiding the raw edge and whip stitching the edge down. Hi team. We are doing the final fitting for the stays. Here's how they look. The lacing is a bit uneven because I still don't have the final lacing for this. I've been looking all around and at the moment I just have thick waxed linen thread, but I think I'll probably have to find something more like cord. Uh, but I just wanted to show you because I think it's really promising. Uh, the lacing is a bit uneven at the back and I think, you know, yet again, this is not the perfect fit, but one day, but I think we're getting closer. But right now, the hitch in activity is that I have to decide whether to add the straps or not. So you can see here that I've just got the straps, the straps pinned on here and at the back. And I have to decide because the last thing I need to do is finish the top binding. And if I attach the straps, then the binding will go over the straps this way and then the armholes. <laughs> you know, I hate making decisions. But basically, so here's the thing. I'm not making a historical reproduction of these stays from Patents of Fashion 5. I just want to make a comfortable, nice pair of stays that fit me well so that I can make 18th century costumes. So that gives me a little bit of leeway because these stays in particular, in a lot of stays from the later period of the 18th century, do have straps. 
But my problem with this is that I already have some 18th century costumes that the neckline of this probably won't work. And the other thing is that I think I've made the neckline of this needs to be lowered by about an inch or so, I've made them too high up. And then the other thing is that they do add quite a lot of support. I do find that they are very helpful in that sense. But I think they will be limiting in terms of the necklines. And I've had experiences where the, the stays show through the neckline. And that's something I want to avoid. So instead, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to bind the top as if these were strapless stays. But I am going to bind also the straps. And then what I can do is if I do want to wear the this with the straps, I can pin them on and sew them on just as I need to. <laughs> this is a bit of a workaround, having to make a decision, but what can I say? Otherwise, I think these are pretty lovely. Uh, I need proper, bind uh, proper lacing to really try them on properly. You can see the lacing is not even at the back. And also you're meant to lace them over your petticoats and rump and stuff. But yeah, just here is a... A quick look at how's it going. But yeah, I think this needs to come down. I don't think it can come down by a lot because I do have my top eyelids just there, but I don't I don't like very no low necklines anyway, so yeah. Thank you for coming along this indecision process. The last step was the cord. Across different sources I could not decide on what to use. Some used silk ribbon or cord. A five strand braid was recommended, thank you Bernadette, but this was not something I could do by myself as I wanted at least four to five meters of lacing so I could do these up by myself. So instead I purchased some cotton and linen cord online which came in an unexpected color <laughs> and for now this will have to do until I can persuade a friend to go with me to the park and braid meters of silk cord thread into a cord. I did end up using eight meters of lacing in the end. And with that they were complete. These were a journey and they are by no means perfect, but I'm very proud of the work that went into them and I quite like the final result. I was very careful and dedicated with the stitches. I really enjoyed the hand sewing process even though it took a lifetime. And yeah, here we are, a finished pair of stays. The other thing I want to mention really quick is that I had to decide whether to add the straps that come with this pattern or not. I decided not to for a few different reasons. One of them being that uh, I think they're more versatile without and they're much easier to put on by yourself without straps. So I'll show you now how I put on stays by myself. Uh, <laughs> it's a journey. <laughs> Please keep an open mind. But what I do is I lace them up beforehand. Uh, and that's why you need a lot of lacing to leave a gap in between each of the stays edges and I leave as wide a gap as I can so that I can easily shimmer, shimmer the, them down like a tube top. Then I sort of turn them around and tighten them as I can and then turn them back into position, tighten them as I can and you know just go from there. They're obviously not the best way to lace them and they're not the best laced that way but it's functional and you know we, I don't have anyone to dress me all the time so <laughs> it has to do. Uh, I've seen other methods. You can not pre-lace them and just lace them on yourself. I just find it easier to pre-lace because it can take a while because these stays have a lot of eyelets. So I'll show you now how I put them on and the finished outfit all together. Thank you for watching.